Today, we are concerned not only about question, questions relating to the security of supply, not only to accessibility of sources, uh, as well to questions relating with uh, environment and social repercussion about the um, energy, the evolution of the energy, and the, re the consequences of the technological revolutions in energy politically, economically, and, and socially. I must, I, I, I would, would, would like to, re to recall some, some th things about uh, current situation and current challenges. The first of this is that the world's growing population. In the last 50 years, world's population has tripled, and if you are over 50, you will have seen the population for instance, of the Middle East, grow fourfold. Global population growth is slowing, as it is still set to go from 7 billion today to 9 billion by 2035. Second, the global economy is growing. While there is a lot of short-term noise, the long-term trend is for the global economy to keep on growing at an average at about 3.5% out to 2035. And third, energy consumption is growing. In the last decades, energy demand grew up by about 50%. And in the next two decades, it's expected to increase about 40%, which is the equivalent of aiding another US and another China to the world energy consumption. Within more US and more China, <laughs> with more population, more growth, and more exigency means maintain a sufficient supply of reliable, affordable, or sustainable energy. This is totally essential to the global growth and development of for the possibilities of uh, the people. We are obviously additional risk, concerns about carbon, particularly concentrated in Europe, the conflict and tensions that in many parts of the world about the evolution of oil and gas. But in many times in the past, one of the consequences of these very important changes is that the energy industry, energy industry has reacted steadily. And uh, it happened as well today. New discoveries on conventional hydrocarbons, the search of unconventional oil and gas, the result of new technologies, the affordable development of some renewable uh, energies, the guarantee of a level of supply cap capable to enough to of meeting the increases in demand, Technology can resolve a lot of these problems. If uh, someone has some doubts, look in this country. Between 2007 and 2011, in 2012, US shale ga ga gas production rose by over 50% each year and its share of total U.S. gas production jumped from 5% to 39%. And between 2007 and 2012, fracking also generated 18, an 18-fold 18 increase in U.S. production on what is now as light tight oil. And the consequences of this transformation for the world, energy is very impressive. The consequences for the U.S., the consequences for the Russia, the consequences for the production of oil in the, of gas in the, in, in, in the Middle East, the consequences for, for uh, economy in America that is transformative for this technological revolution is very impressive. And I think there is no doubt that the evolution of technology can resolve in the future, the problems relating with the growing population, 
and the ground ex agency of, for supplies for the people. Technolo te te technology can resolve. And uh, this is a, a not easy question, but this, uh, I think, optimistic but possible vision of the evolution of these uh, circumstances in the markets. With all the tensions, with all the problems, with very difficult in some uh, countries, in, in some areas, it would the necessity to establish, to establish new balances in political terms and economic terms between different regions. But this, uh, this is my introduction, my first intervention. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, you made so many points, which I think we'll come back to during the course of the discussion. I think it's a perfect segue uh, to a discussion, perhaps, uh, on Haiti. And uh, you spoke a moment ago about the role of technology. And I know that quite often uh, technology is viewed as a negative force, as displacing jobs, perhaps, and that sort of thing. I think in Haiti, with different initiatives like uh, Smart Village and other things, we're really seeing that technology can be a positive force, particularly with respect to access to energy and to electricity. And I'm wondering uh, if you might touch on that in addition to providing us with some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you, President Asna, and thank you to the Concordia Summit for, for having me here. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks mostly on rural energy, uh, rural electricity, because it's one point, of course, you have over 47% of the world's population is rural, and they account for 70% of the world's poor, therefore not having access to electricity. And we did so um, thinking that it would be very costly and, and would take a long time to rebuild some of the infrastructure. So we wanted to go because we felt that clean energy production could power all of Haiti and, and all of the Caribbean countries because we have one natural resource, which is the sun. And, uh, and some of our countries have you know, different, di different ways of getting to, to clean energy. So considering the cost per kilowatt hour, not only in Haiti, but in the Caribbean, we're talking about 35 cents per kilowatt hour um, in Haiti and, and a little bit more in the surrounding countries, it makes sense to go you know, with, the, with the clean energy strategy to power and give light to, uh, to, our, to our population. So um, the concept that we developed in many um, of, of our villages, mostly rural, poor, um, is, is a smart village initiative, which is essentially um, putting some nano grids um, with th that power villages up to three to 500 people um, with an off-grid strategy by putting three to, five, uh, three to five kilowatts per village distributed and having the, the, the person the resident being able to power at least two bulbs, charge their phones, and, uh, and so that the children have lights to study. So it's a very basic approach, and it's a very uh, uh, innovative, if you want, approach to a huge problem um, that we face. So the Smart Village initiative calls for um, renewable energy throughout the village, in the public lighting, uh, in the homes, um, having having one one panel um, in the, in, in uh, you know that provides the necessary the, the very necessary energy and at the same time having the people um, actually re reduce their monthly budget by five dollars per resident, which is huge considering the fact that they're living on less than a dollar a day in in this area. So. So the smart village we felt in terms of rural development as, you know, when, when we're here in a forum like this, thinking about rural development and thinking about ways of, you know, reducing poverty and reducing inequality is to be able to provide, the, you know, the energy as a, as a government, as a, as a leader to, to people in a way that also helps them not to cut down um, would because Haiti 
on top of all our problems, on top of the earthquake, on top of the destruction, we have 98.5% of deforestation that has accounted for destruction of our, a lot of our um, coffee crops, for example, um, our production. We used to be one of the biggest exporters of coffee um, in the world, and that production, and that actually, you know, we were one of the richest French colonies, and coffee was definitely on top uh, of that, and that went down. So now the Haitian coffee is almost going to extinction because of deforestation. So going with the clean energy, going with the smart village, and providing uh, solar energy, which is, you know, in abundance, is one way that we, we install over, over 10,000 solar panels uh, throughout the country, and we invested heavily in that. And we're, you know, so now I have a foundation that we're continuing into the Smart Village uh, initiative. And we took a very small village, and we want to we, we wanna take that village and make it a model, you know, for the developing world into showing how, how you know, clean energy can, you know, change the lives of those who have, who have nothing, basically, and in a, in a sustainable way. So those are my opening remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, John. Um, my name is John Morton. I'm with the National Security Council at the White House. And before that, uh, as Samantha mentioned, I was at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, where for five and a half years uh, we uh, worked uh, uh, intensively and successfully to transition an investment portfolio from one which had been relatively uh, relatively heavily focused on fossil fuel to an investment portfolio that was very much dominated by renewable energy. Uh, and of course, as a development finance institution, uh, it feels good to be able to say that because we weren't picking deals. Deals were coming to us for finance. So it was very much of a market-driven transformation. Let me just offer a couple observations up front about the, the nature of the um, of Pan American Energy as 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 we see it, uh, some of the efforts that that we're uh, that, that that we are undertaking, um, and then conclude with a with a specific set of examples uh, within the context of Canada and Mexico that we've uh, that we've uh, rolled out relatively recently. So the first thing I would say is that uh, to to echo something President Aznar said, um, the transformation of the U.S. energy systems, of course, is uh, has been seismic, uh, recognized, I'm sure, by many people in this room. Uh, but probably not really fully appreciated by most of uh, the people in this country and I'm sure other countries as well. Uh, I think it will probably come as no surprise to those in this room that the U.S. is now the number one hydrocarbon producer in the world. Uh, that, that occurred during a very, very short period of time. And the fact that the U.S. is now a significant and increasing exporter of both oil and gas and liquid natural gas um, has had an impact on global energy markets, provides a significant um, uh, 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 new dynamic in regional and hemispheric energy policy, and one that we see quite positively. The second dynamic that has changed, and I'm sure will come as no surprise in anyone in this room, but, but the, the, the nature of it, the degree to it, is often quite striking, uh, is the transition to a lower carbon economy. Um, renewable prices continue to fall. I think folks know that, but they continue to fall. We were just having a conversation before. The price of installed solar has fallen this year again by up to 20, 30 percent. That's striking. At OPIC, we would have clients come in six months at one point uh, with a project and say, we're going to come back in six months from now when this project is economic. We want to get on your portfolio, we want to get into the portfolio now, into the, into the pipeline, because we know in six months the economics are going to have changed uh, sufficiently to allow this project to be financed. And we see that over and over again as the economics on renewables continue to fall. Last year, as you know, there was more investment in renewable energy generation globally than there was in fossil fuel generation. There was more megawatts of capacity of renewable energy installed globally than there was fossil fuel. That's astounding, and that's going to continue. That's a trend that will continue. Um, uh, so those two, those two dynamics, I think, are very much at the core of uh, of, of global energy markets and certainly the hemispheric uh, dynamic that we're, that we're talking about to he, uh, here today. I'd say we're really focused on four things uh, as an administration. Uh, the first is supply diversification within the hemisphere. The second is policy reform and enabling policy reform that catalyzes private capital flows, which is the third thing, really focusing on uh, creating incentives and policy reforms which enable 
uh, private capital flows. And the last is regional integration, putting in place frameworks, structures that allow for uh, cross-border energy markets to develop and strengthen. And on that front, I'll just highlight something very briefly and then turn the floor back um, that we did with Canada and Mexico at the North American Leaders Summit uh, at the end of June. Uh, we took a look at, uh, frankly, uh, new and, and, uh, and, and forward-thinking leadership in, in Canada and Mexico, looked at the energy plans that were being developed both domestically in the United States uh, through the extension of the investment and production tax credits uh, and through the Clean Power Plan, looked at Mexico's uh, clean energy transition law and saw in Prime Minister Trudeau a, uh, a Prime Minister whose commitment to, uh, to renewable energy and to climate change more generally provided an opportunity for us to uh, come together. And the leaders did something fairly remarkable when they came together in uh, late June. They committed to a clean energy, I should say we committed to a clean energy target of 50 percent clean energy by the year 2025. And the only way that occurs is through more integrated regional markets. So as part of that announcement, we highlighted six transmission lines, six cross-border transmission lines, which were in various stages of permitting, which we're now uh, uh, um, uh, leaning into, uh, representing 5,000 megawatts of additional energy, most of it renewable. Um, we put in place uh, a policy framework and a, and a technical assistance working group to study and make recommendations for strengthening uh, grid reliability and resilience, uh, both to guard against uh, an increasingly vulnerable uh, cross-border uh, transmission lines, but also uh, transmission lines which are receiving increasingly intermittent power in the form of renewables. Um, we agreed to harmonize the social cost of carbon that our countries use in calculating uh, uh, new energy that will go on to the grid. That's a very important, as you know, market signal uh, to new entrants. Uh, and finally, we agreed to uh, develop and release this year the mid-century decarbonization strategies that are called for uh, in the Paris Agreement. Uh, they're not called for to be done this year. They're called for to be done over time and before 2020. But Canada, Mexico, and the United States agreed to complete those strategies and release them this year in time for the next conference of the parties, which will occur in Marrakesh in November. So I, that, that gives you a sense of both, I think, dynamics that are, as we see, that are occurring globally, uh, being in large part driven by dom uh, domestic energy production here in the U.S. Some of the principles that we look at as we think about what a Pan-American energy strategy should look at, and then a specific example of the U.S.-Canada-Mexico partnership that we were able to uh, develop uh, in the lead-up to the, to the NALS conference in June. Thank you. John, thank you. And just to cap off the U.S. perspective, um, I'd like to turn it over to Neil Chatterjee. And Neil, I know you're, ho you're here in your personal capacity, but uh, you do work in Congress. And it would be very interesting to hear how you think about how legislatures in the Americas more generally can work to support uh, uh, Pan-American Energy Alliance. Uh, thank you uh, for the question and thank you for having me. Um, you know, legislative bodies are collaborative bodies. Uh, it takes cooperation and consensus to, uh, to put together the policies uh, that can uh, better uh, effectuate uh, the deployment of technologies, uh, maintain uh, and, and, and advance uh, the grid and our energy infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and move forward in our energy future. Uh, the challenge of operating within a legislative body is that uh, when it comes to energy uh, development, uh, different people have different approaches based on the constituencies they represent. Uh, therein lies some of the challenges to both uh, maintaining uh, our existing fossil fuel infrastructure in some parts of the U.S. Um, and other regions of the country are, are moving in a, a far greater uh, accelerated pace towards adopting clean energy solutions. Uh, trying to find that balance in an environment where uh, you've got to address uh, challenges regarding carbon mitigation while maintaining affordability and reliability can be difficult. Um, the Prime Minister talked about um, the importance of, uh, of rural communities having access to reliable uh, and affordable electricity. Uh, that's a challenge in the U.S. as well. Um, you know, what uh, it takes to develop infrastructure in uh, Manhattan and build out transmission here and the constituency it would serve is very different than what it takes to build out infrastructure in rural Kentucky. And so we have, you know, challenges um, that, uh, that these folks bring to bear. Um, 
in Senator McConnell's state of Kentucky, where we're 92 percent dependent on coal-fired generation, even though market forces, regulatory forces are putting a lot of pressure on the coal industry, the constituency there, which you know uh, uh, relies upon coal for direct employment uh, in in the mines, but as well as uh, indirect employment that can come from access to uh, to low cost uh, uh, reliable electricity. You know, people are concerned about what moving away from coal fire generation will mean for the economy in a state like Kentucky and throughout uh, that region. But similarly, if you go uh, out, out west to Nevada, uh, you can make a very concise and clear case that uh, the uh, as John pointed out, the 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 rapid decrease uh, in the cost of solar has made renewables more competitive, and uh, where someone in Kentucky may view increased deployment of technology and renewables as a threat to uh, their you know, job stability in Kentucky, it's opportunity in other regions of the country. And I think the, the, the key role that legislatures can play is responsibly integrating these transformations. These transformations uh, are going to occur. How do we responsibly integrate the new technology to make sure that we, uh, we ensure the stability of our energy infrastructure? Um, as it pertains to, to Pan American Energy, I think uh, the the greatest lesson that can be learned from the U.S. legislative process is to you know to look at some of the steps that we took in building out our infrastructure and uh, and and learn from from uh, our successes and failures in in, in building out uh, energy infrastructure in developing countries. Um, I think a focus on energy efficiency will be important. Um, you know the uh, uh, the kilowatt hour you know, from generation not built is the cheapest kilowatt hour you can get. And I think an increased focus on efficiency will be significant. Um, I think we need to better enable demand response to, uh, to, to protect consumers. And I think there are lessons uh, from, from the U.S. Uh, system that uh, can, uh, can be applied there. And then, um, again, I think we have to look at, you know, the, the basis for any uh, electricity grid is reliable baseload power. And some of the challenges that we face today continually in the U.S. about how to balance the trade-offs between maintaining reliable baseload generation while ad addressing emissions, uh, those challenges are going to be faced in, uh, uh, throughout uh, uh, Latin America as well. How do you, you know, with uh, uh, projected increases in, in population, increased demand for electricity as the middle class in Latin America grows and, uh, and demand increases for, for televisions, for refrigerators, for air conditioners, um, you know, that, that demand has to be met. Balancing the, the capacity to provide the baseload to meet that demand uh, while trying to uh, curb emissions will be a challenge, and I think uh, it's an important uh, discussion. Neil, thank you. And I have just three general questions I'd like to throw out to the group, and then perhaps we can hear from some uh, folks around the table. But I would just like to ask everyone what you think a Pan-American Energy Alliance actually looks like. I think that it probably means about a billion different things to everybody around this table. Uh, second, what are potential disruptor disruptors to a Pan-American Energy Alliance? Um, Venezuela comes to mind, and I'd be very interested in hearing from some of our colleagues from South America about how they view the situation in Venezuela and uh, the bond restructuring that uh, started to occur on Friday. And finally, what role the private sector can actually play on inno innovative financing mechanisms or supporting public-private partnerships or supporting technology to help fuel source diversification and to reduce emissions, which is, I, from my perspective at least, in our long-term economic and energy interests. So with that, I'm wondering if perhaps um, we could turn to somebody around the table who would like to ask a question or make a comment. Yes, please. Hi. My name is Bill Bean. I'm with Phillips Lighting. We're in one of over 160 countries, including uh, many of the South American, Central, and also North American countries. I, I'd like to look at this as a demand side problem because I think except for the speaker from Haiti and uh, the last speaker, we've been talking mainly about supply. And then I'll get back to your comment. Um, in terms of demand, here's the challenge we have, and we see this uh, globally, is that energy consumption is increasing by 3 percent per annum, hasn't stopped, whereas the actual reduction of energy uh, consumption through retrofits, renovation, and so on, and alternative energies is only increasing by 1.5 percent. This gap really matters. 
Last month, NASA announced that this was the hottest month in recorded history. We um, have seen over the past, and it matters, 100 years ago, or over the past 100 years, sea level rise only occurred to the uh, seven and a half inches. If we continue on this path, everyone, it's going to be six and a half feet in 30 to 50 years. That will affect 40% of our seaboards in the United States. That will affect South America, Central America extensively, and it goes further. I was just in a briefing last night where they said that marine stocks, fish, and the Western Atlantic um, near the coast of Africa are now depleting. 90% um, of the food stock for some of the towns that are fishermen basically feed the village are there no more. So we have to do something. So I think we need to move from a fossil economy, fossil fuel economy, as quickly as possible to a balanced economy where we use the best of fossil fuels, natural gas, but we also look at alternative energies and, frankly, the fifth alternative energy, which is retrofits. And what I'd like to encourage people to think about is that the building stock is an easy target for all of our governments to address through retrofits. Forty percent of energy consumption comes from buildings. And if we can think out a policy mechanism where when it changes hands from a tenant to a new tenant, an owner to a different owner, if at that time we can exact a change in some very simple technology, for, so for example, in lighting where I'm from in HVAC, um, that's 80% of a building consumption of energy. Lighting is 15% um, of the world electricity load. We can reduce that with technology available today by 40 to 50% by simply changing to LED and adding software that automates the HVAC and the lighting reduces it by another 40 to 50%. So the technology is here. So I urge the governments to change the policies as much as possible with some simple changes. I urge corporations to walk the talk. We've committed ourselves to reduce our global greenhouse gases, our carbon footprint to zero in four years. We've committed to ship two billion LED light bulbs. Um, we've committed to put in, and we have 100 off-grid lighting um, uh, positions in Africa. And that's the last point. Um, there are over 1.1 billion people in the world without electricity, which is just criminal, right, if you think about it from social justice. So I encourage us to think about from an off-grid perspective what can we do from a policy angle and also from an NGO to address that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Samantha. Thank you so much for your comments, and I couldn't agree more to put it quite simply. And I'm wondering if perhaps we could now turn to our esteemed colleague from the Wilson Center. Thank you very much, Samantha. I'm Roger Mark D'Souza from the Woodrow Wilson Center. And as um, I wanted to echo a little bit of what we've been talking about so far as we look at the Paris Agreement. One of the things that we have been impressed with is that the Paris Agreement has really taken climate diplomacy to a new level, particularly with regards to the energy sector. It has really broken it out of a silo where climate change and energy is now understood as part of a larger international and bilateral cooperation on security, economics, human rights, and a range of other issues. And, and uh, Patricio and I were just chatting and, and saying that part of the challenge for an alliance for the Americas, and this gets to your, your question, Samantha, uh, are the challenges around rule of law. What is the regulatory framework that we need within a specific country, but also across the region? And for me, this is a question of a, a disruptive force. It's not a disruptor like Venezuela, but in the absence of rule of law across the region, I, I think this is a real challenge. And I'd love to hear from my uh, colleagues around the, the table um, on their thoughts on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think rule of law is something that's front and center for many of us, uh, both in government and in the private sector, and um, something that I hope that we can all work on more collaboratively. And if you don't mind, sir, thank you so much for being with us. But I'd be deeply interested, and I'm sure the rest of us would be as well, just what your view is uh, on the energy outlook on the continent. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you very much, Samantha. Well, first of all, energy consumption in the world will keep growing. 
in per capita terms and also in absolute terms. And that implies a huge challenge to the Paris Agreement to keep a temperature increase below two degrees during the, the rest of this century. And therefore, we are facing a huge challenge, even if we take into account all the technologies improvement that we are already seeing. With respect to, to Latin America or to Pan American Alliance, of course, if we can integrate all our systems, we will get a better system because it will be safer, it will be more economic, and at the same time, will be cleaner because we will be able not only to maximize efficiency within a country, but to maximize efficiency within this alliance. And from that point of view, for instance, Europe is almost fully integrated. And they are working to have a single energy market. That means that they will always be producing with a lower cost and with the best technology in terms of uh, greenhouses emissions. In, in the US, you have three systems, one in the East Coast, one in the West Coast, another one in the Texas or Midwest, Midwest which are not yet integrated. And that's a big challenge for the U.S. And they have some integration with Canada and some integration with Mexico, but not, uh, not enough. In the case of uh, Central America, they are almost fully integrated. So they have accomplished a system where they can really m maximize efficiency in terms of cost and in terms of, of, of uh, emissions at the same time. In Latin America, we are very little integrated. Basically, uh, the main problem is the rule of law, of course, because there have been some uh, integration efforts which have failed because there, there was not a strong rule of law system that will guarantee all the investment that are needed for that. Uh, in, in the main exporters of energy in Latin America are Paraguay and Uruguay in terms of the percentage uh, internal gross product. And the main, uh, imp I mean, the main importers are Argentina, Brazil, and Ecuador. And the main exporters are Uruguay and Paraguay. So there's a huge potential in Latin America, even without new further technological improvements, that if we integrate the system, we'll be able to have a safer system, cleaner system, and more economic for everybody. And that has been extremely difficult because of, not because of technical problems. There are a, a lot of studies that prove that we can do that within a five-year period in a very efficient way. The main problem is that we don't have the right kind of uh, legal system or rule of law system, because at the end of the day, we don't want just to integrate our system. We want them to act as a single market. It's not just a question of building lines. We have to be able to, be able to produce the energy wherever it is cleaner and more economic. And for that, we need to, to do a huge effort in order to improve our rule of law and the legal framework that will guarantee that that uh, effort will succeed. We are doing a huge effort within the Pacific Alliance, and we are working on that very hardly, in order to have a single energy market. So we will be able to integrate our market with Mexico, with Colombia, with uh, Peru, and with Chile. And of course, we want to integrate to that other countries like Argentina, Bolivia, and Ecuador. So basically, I think that if we, we have three hopes in order to, to be able to solve this problem. First of all is to increase energy efficiency. Basically, we can do the same thing with less energy. We are doing that. I mean, right now, we are consuming 40% less than we would have consumed with the technology that we had 30 years ago. But at the same time, the population is increasing, GDP in the emerging bank markets is increasing, there is 1.1 billion people without electricity and they need that, of course we won't keep them out of the system just because that will put more pressure on, on, on emissions. So basically the challenge that we have, first we can move and, and, uh, and progress a lot in terms of uh, energy efficiency. And, and there are a lot of commitments with respect to that, how to change the relationship between energy and GNP in order to be more efficient, not only in terms of energy, but basically in terms of uh, emissions. The second possibility, of course, is to uh, increase the percentage of renewable clean energies in our matrix. And technology is improving so rapidly. For instance, five years ago in Chile we have a, an auction, energy auction. At that time, solar energy was not competitive. A few months ago we had another auction for 
for the for the system. I mean, it's, it's a long-term auction, and basically, solar energy was unbeatable, because right now we can produce energy in some areas. Of course, in Chile we have the highest uh, radiant deserts in the world, and therefore we can we have a, a very good uh, load factor for uh, for solar energy and for wind energy, and therefore the second source of progress is of course to increase the percentage of renewable energy. Right now, fossil energy represents about 42% of the total matrix. By 2040, it will come down to 30% in relative terms, but in absolute terms, it will keep growing. And the third source of efficiency is, of course, integration. If we can integrate our markets within the whole Americas, all the Americas, we would be able to save in terms of emission, about 23%, and in terms of cost, about 21%, just by allowing the most efficient producer to be producing at, 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 at a given point in time. Because many times, a very efficient producer is not producing, and a not very efficient producer is producing. And since we have different solar, uh, uh, different uh, seasons, and at the same time, we have different uh, solar times, that could be extremely efficient. So there we have three main sources to improve the efficiency of our energy system in the Americas. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm very hopeful that we do become more efficient for all the reasons that you outlined. And I'd like to turn it over to President Osnar one more time. Really, I sincerely agree with uh, the remarks of uh, President Sebastián Piñera. I think much to recall, because I work in, in different years a lot in, in, in Latin America, relating, for instance, with the um, integration in the Central American countries, electricity integration in Central American countries. And uh, working a lot in the, in the idea on the, on the, um, on the Atlantic Basin. It is not a Pan-American and Pan-Atlantic, uh, but you must recall that in terms of oil, gas, food, water, Bottle. And raw materials, the most important area in the world is the Atlantic. <coughs> it's not the Middle East, it's not the Pacific, it's not the Atlantic. What is the problem of this? It's different problems in terms of energy, because if you look in the growth of Latin American countries, fortunately, last decade, or last decade and a half, we can look at uh, new middle classes, new process of uh, uh, urban people that establish more exigencies in terms of supply of electricity, of uh, energy, or water. But, uh, and we must look in some social conflict for, it's very complicated for governments trying to solve or to supply these exigencies of the, of the people. But we must recall today that more than 30 million people in Latin America that are not have the access to electricity. And th 35 million who don't have access to potable water. And this is a, in, in a consequence of different situation, but there's one that I can to I'd like to today, to stress today is fragmentation of markets is very negative for the supplies, for efficiency, for sustainability. And uh, the existence of the of fragmentation of markets in Latin America is very complicated. Fragmentation of, of markets means as well lack of infrastructures. And the lack of infrastructures is a very serious problem because without infrastructures, it's impossible <laughs> to establish an uh, organized supply for the people. And uh, I think to advance, to take decisions in terms of uh, more integration in markets is totally fundamental. With taking decisions in terms of infrastructures. I think it's, it is very complicated to imagine that only governments, only public budgets can do the necessary investments 
in uh, energy infrastructure will be necessary the public private investment and coalition to resolve this problem see, to open uh, the possibility of supplies and to establish more uh, mm, more uh, more important markets and uh, the advantage you know say it for for Latin America in, in this pan-american and pan-atlantic idea it says the cleanest energy matter in the world is existing in Latin America. 25% of renewables, you or high, high, high hydroelectricity and um, biofuels. But uh, the dependency of oil, of gas, and so on continues to be extremely important. Anyway, in my view, the more important question relating to the Pan American in, in relating with uh, uh, Latin America is first of all, to avoid the fragmentation of markets, very important public private cooperation in terms of the infrastructures and if improving the efficiency of the systems, trying to resolve the problems that affect and millions of people uh, still in some countries in, in Latin America. Thank you so much for that. And I was so struck by a figure in, I believe it was your 2014 op-ed, the Atlantic Basin accounts for one third of global oil and gas. So it's certainly an area where we need to pay a lot of attention as we think about a Pan-American Energy Alliance. And building on President Pinera's comments, I now like to turn it over to you, Your Excellency, to speak about uh, energy exports, perhaps. I believe you had an, an intervention. Well, I'm no expert. I'm only a politician. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to put forth a, a couple of remarks on <coughs> Pan-American energy integration and so on. The first thing I, th I must tell you that thinking Pan-American is a huge goal and a very um, good goal but I would prefer to approach this subject in a modular way. What do I mean? In my part of the world, I come from Uruguay, we have a very fairly good integration, electrical integration, between Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. We have interconnection. We have huge hydroelectrical dams that produce one of the biggest in the world, in Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, and my own country. So we just finished the connection with the south of Brazil. We have this uh, ring of connections which make it very easy. Um, on the second place, some of our countries, like mine, have developed an important percentage of energy from sustainable wind, solar, in a very, very successful policy. I say it from the other side of the political spectrum. Um, so what are the obstacles? Which are the hurdles to this, this kind of, of endeavor? Sometimes are governments, well, sometimes, all, almost all the time, are governments that, for instance, have monopoly on the production or import of fuel, like my country, or that tax fuel and electric energy. So the main thing, or the main uh, job for the private sector would be to focus on uh, teaching governments or informing them about the benefits of this integration. If you remember, the European Union began not as a European Union or a common market, but on the subject of steel and coal at the end of the war. So I would think that sometimes we speak so many, so many times about an integration in our part of the world, and we think it's magic, which is not. It's much better to go step by step, and I would say that a clear proposal of eliminating all obstacles to the transit of energy, eliminating monopolies, eliminating taxation on the price of energy, would be a major step in the development of our part of the world. With gas, President Piñera knows what happened with Argentina. 
knows that Chile had the pipeline to buy uh, gas from Argentina. But one day, Argentina decided to uh, tap or, or to close the tap, and Chile remained with the pipeline, as we have one with Buenos Aires, which is full of whatever goes there, cockroaches or somebody going f from Buenos Aires to Montevideo, Montevideo, Buenos Aires. So the private sector must be an influence of the goodness, of the fairness, of the, 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 the good fruits we could get through integration, and we could try to um, begin negotiating a common market of energy. For instance, we were going to buy from Paraguay, who's flooded with electric energy at a very low price, as you all know, it's one of the assets of this development, recent development of Paraguay, with one of the, um, the countries that grows economically much better than all, all the others in the region. And we have the uh, grid from uh, Paraguay through Argentina to Uruguay. The toll we were expecting to pay was $12. They asked for 48 in Argentina. So it made it impossible to take advantage of the proximity of Paraguay. So I would focus on that region, Chile, Brazil, Bolivia, Uruguay, Paraguay, south of Brazil. That is a main target. And we could organize a conference of, on this sole subject. That would be for Concordia to do a great good to put a, all the governments and the private sector and looking at the, 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 the evidence that it's for the good, it's a win-win situation, we could do a great good this uh, subject and this uh, endeavor. Governments must be uh, taught about this, the, 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 the virtues of this kind of integration. We have the beginning, we have the, the, the general uh, organization, and I would uh, str strongly advocate not say, being so pan-American at the beginning, but ma making it modular, first in our region and then others. Because when Mr. Piñera says, with Mexico and, and all the Pacific al Alliance, it's thousands of kilometers in the sense of the meridians. Let's look at the parallels. Sometimes horizontally, you can reason in a better, most economic way about energy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And Mr. Prime Minister, could I ask you about Venezuela and what's going on there and what you think is likely to occur in the short term? In Concerning the situation in Venezuela, I think every Caribbean country today is very concerned about that situation because of the, uh, the agreement, the energy agreement that the Caribbean has with, uh, with Venezuela. And uh, j just for a circling back, it's an agreement that provides um, basically a discount on the shipment of oil. It provides anywhere, depending on the, the price of oil, if it's over $40 a barrel, the, the discount goes from, from 30 to 60% on the barrel with the balance invested in development projects for the country. And for some countries, that development um, budget accounts to between uh, anywhere from 10 to 90% of the investment budget of the country. So no need to, to tell you why people are nervous about this uh, disagreements. Considering the situation in Venezuela, um, with all the political uh, turmoil that's happening there. You know, a discussion like we're having today is important to discuss that because we're talking about, you know, 18 countries in our region. And I know the White House has, you know, has engaged and taken the leadership with the Vice President holding uh, several uh, conferences on, on, on the topic. And, uh, and it's one that has to certainly take into account not only the Pan, the Pan American, but you know, not forgetting the Caribbean um, in the equation, because it's certainly uh, 
one one problem that has to be addressed. You know, consider a country like like my country, Haiti. We depend ninety percent of of our investment depend on petrochemical, you know, revenues. So when you take that out of the equation, um, and it, so it's not only an energy approach; it's a development approach because the energy is provided, and on top of that, you know, we we were able to build to do over three hundred twenty five projects. And the, the, the total amount received for investment was about $1.8 billion in eight years, which is certainly, you know, it's replaceable, but it has to be done, uh, you know, with urgency. It has to be done certainly, you know, with an integration and looking at, of course, renewable energy, clean energy, as we've been talking about, and, and including that into the discussion um, to find a hemispheric uh, solution to this problem because it's not only a problem that will face Haiti or or Jamaica, but it will face all the region if there is a huge crisis that that happens from an ending of Petrocaribe. Of course, it was the problem was was partially solved, I would say, because of the low because of the new oil price. You know, at, at the prices where they are today, there is no investment uh, you know budget available, so it's 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 already taken. You know, we've already taken a huge hit, but you know, I, I believe that in in uh, if we're talking about having an energy alliance, it's cr it's critical to think about you know three points. One, for you know the the Caribbean countries and smaller countries is to take is to take into account the access to capital, to con you know to go from fossil fuel, how most of us are, to um, clean energy, and to have access to to certainly the, the multilateral institutions to, to help with the financing. Um, having also the right policies and regulations in place, because as we bring the private sector, um, it's important to have the, the, the proper, you know, to establish the rules, the ground rules, um, for everybody to be able to invest in a transparent way and everybody benefit from that investment. And, 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 uh, and certainly, you know, the last point is to take into account the asymmetric nature of these markets in order to have a better integration as we're doing these policies and these alliances. So the, the alliance is the logical next step, I would say, into the sustainability of, uh, of policies and, and, and energy in our region and, uh, and doing it in a way that takes into account all the deficiencies and, and, and issues that, that some of the smaller countries are facing. Thank you so much for your response on that. And uh, we are basically out of time. Um, and so uh, if anybody has any closing questions, please put up your placard. Uh, yes, please. Uh, right. Uh, I'm uh, Philippe Embericos. I'm involved in transportation of energy. And I'm like a poor trucker of the seas. So. Uh, but I have, I have, I have really a, a, a general question, which is going to upset everybody, uh, which is really: Do we want cheap oil or expensive oil? The the cheap oil has not brought the benefits to the industrial countries that we used to be familiar with. Uh, on the contrary, it's created a lot of problems to emerging countries. Uh, it has also uh, increased the consumption of oil in the rich countries because they use gas guzzlers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And really, uh, uh, we, we are wasting uh, uh, fo fossil fuel, you know, oil, which is very precious in the long term for transportation and for chem chemical uh, industry. Uh, therefore, maybe there's a point of having a high price of oil and a low price of gas. Low price of gas has been very good because it has reduced the consumption of coal, which is the worst uh, you know, enemy in terms of, of, of pollution. But if we have a high price of oil, we will have a, a window for renewable energy, which will develop much faster. So I think these are just a few comments. If anybody has an answer to that, thank you. John, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I'll put you on the spot on that one. Uh, not speaking as a member of the administration and the White House on this one. In your personal uh, capacity. Uh, speaking very much in a personal capacity, I think that um, I, I, I agree entirely with what you've said. 
I think that uh, our goal as policymakers needs to be to push for diversification uh, on the basis of national security uh, considerations, on the basis of national sovereignty uh, uh, considerations, and on the basis of uh, environmental uh, and health considerations. And uh, it's one of the four principles that I suggested up uh, in my early remarks is that diversification of supply uh, is, is, is something that we support well beyond conventional oil and gas uh, industries. Um, I will say that I think that there is a uh, small but growing consensus, and in fact a large but growing consensus in some parts of the world that uh, uh, the externalities of uh, fossil fuels are not appropriately accounted for in our um, in our policy making decisions and this is why I mentioned the social cost of carbon conversation that Mexico and Canada and the US have agreed to align which we think is a very important part of setting in place a market which is beginning to price externalities in a more important way and I think following that conversation forward whether it takes the form of a tax down the road or a cap and trade system uh, will be an interesting space to watch uh, because that I think will do for pricing in a uh, regulatory way uh, what the market doesn't necessarily do or hasn't traditionally done uh, on its own. John, thank you and a huge thanks to our chair and our other panelists and everyone around the table and on your question I'll just say we'll convince Matt Swift and the rest of the group to perhaps make that a topic for next year's strategic dialogue where I hope to see all of you and thank you for joining.